Hi, and welcome to the National New Teacher Support Podcast brought to you by New Teacher University. This is a podcast for teachers, by teachers, and I'm your principal, Dr. Terry Ross, and I'm also your host, New Teachers. I am so glad to start the year off with you. This is the first podcast of 2024, and I'm so excited that you came back for the second semester. I'm so excited that you're not one of those new teachers that did not come back after the first semester because we do have some new teachers. So thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for believing in our children and we need you. Yes, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, this is the podcast for teachers by teachers and I'm your principal, Dr. Terry Ross. The subject that we're gonna talk about today is how to make real world connections. When we see our students sometimes in the classroom, and they're bored, they don't feel like they get it, it's because they don't see themselves or they don't see their surroundings represented in the work. And that's where real world connections come in. I'm excited to have Ms. Carrie Hollingsworth with us, the owner and CEO of Work of Heart Educational Services. And she's going to be speaking with us today about making real world connection with our students. She's an award-winning teacher She's also a consultant and trainer. So we're excited to have her with us today. So Ms. Hollingsworth, will you introduce yourself and tell us why did you start Work of Heart Educational Services? Certainly. So again, my name is Carrie Hollingsworth. I am the owner and CEO of Work of Heart Educational Services. I am also a math instructional coach uh, in Central Florida. Uh, I've been in the Central Florida uh, area teaching since 2004, so (laughs) quite a little while in the game. Uh, I've taught first grade through third, um, became an ELA and science coach, and now have landed on math instructional coaching, which is my favorite subject, actually. So I'm glad I finally um, get a chance to do this work. Um, I graduated from the University of Central Florida twice, (laughs) once in 2004 with my bachelor's, and then just in 2021, with my uh, master's in K through eight math and science. And Work of Heart Educational Services started started as a tutoring company. In the beginning, it didn't have this name. It was me just doing what I love, which is helping students understand what they don't understand already in a way that's comfortable and understandable for them. Uh, In 2019, uh, the pandemic came along and Everyone had to figure out how do I work without going outside. (laughs) And so virtual tutoring uh, became what I offered. And I decided then to turn my tutoring into a licensed or LLC certified business. And so that's where the name uh, came in. And like I said, I was focused on helping children do what they didn't know how to do with that, whether that be reading comprehension, phonics, math, science, whatever it was. Um, And then around 2022, I met this incredible education consultant uh, and coach named Erica Jordan Thomas. And she helped me and other educators like myself see the, the beyond the boundaries of what we thought we could do with our skills and talents. And so that's where I kind of shifted from just offering tutoring to focusing on consulting and including uh, adults into my focus and not um, just children like I would do in the classroom. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that because you have a wide range. You've been an ELA lead or coach. You've been a science and math. That's a wide range. And this is so perfect for this topic, real world connections, because if you're strong in ELA, you can own the language of any other content area. So you're really so capable and so prepared for this topic for our new teachers. So I'm excited about that. And yes, we have all encountered uh, Dr. EJT. Absolutely. (laughs) So excited about what we're learning from her. So uh, let's get into it. Let's talk about it. Um, We're going to talk today about new teachers. We're going to talk about real world connections. And so tell us, Ms. Hollinsworth, what are real world connections when it comes to the classroom? So a real world connection is a link that you make between what you're learning in the classroom and what you've experienced throughout your life. And 
I won't, I'll say not even just what you've experienced, what you've seen, what you observed. Uh, Cause I was the kind of student where if I would see something I was reading in a book or discussing in the classroom. And then my mind would go to, oh, that's like what I saw on that movie. You know, such and such, because I, I love movies. I'm also an actress. So I link a lot of things to TV, movies, plays. And so that kind of helps me do that kind of thing a little easily. Absolutely, because it's bringing the world inside the classroom, but it's mm -hmm. also taking the child out to the world. Yes. And our students really need that. And so many times, that's why our students are bored. That's why they don't get into the content. And yes. especially sometimes our little boys. Ooh, our, our boys need those connections. Our girls need them too. Mm -hmm. But our boys really need them because our boys are more into informational type text, nonfiction type things. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes little girls can go along with the storyline, you know, reading a nice story and things like that. Well, boys want to know how does this work and how does that work? You know, those right. are the type of things. So I'm so excited that we're having this topic today because it's so befitting for all of our students. Definitely. Absolutely. So when we look at real world connections, what are the benefits of real world connections for our students in the classroom? So like you mentioned, it makes them more engaged because they feel like there's a reason that I need to pay attention to this. When it's when we teach things without that connection, they don't see why this is relevant. Why do I need this? How many times we heard kids say, when am I going to use this? Why do I need to know this? I don't need to. I'm not going to use this when I <laughs> go into the world. But if you can get them engaged and get them to see why this matters, not just in these four walls, but when I leave your classroom and go to the next school and grow up and become an adult, I care more, so I give it more. And so my achievement is going to go up because I paid more attention. I will work harder for it because I know why I need to become good at whatever this content is. Um, so the achievement and the engagement together will, will increase, but also it allows them to transfer the skills that we want them to learn and the content we need them to understand into the real world. If I can get you to understand money in my classroom, you can go transfer that and balance your checkbook if we still use those. Uh, you can control your spending on your credit card You know, when you become uh, older. So there's a lot of transferability when a child can make connections. And then also just knowing how to be an effective citizen and a globally aware a uh, person who understands what's going on out there. Um, for example, if, I, if we're reading a story or even a, a biography about a certain person or mm -hmm. a moment in history, you can now be aware, oh, life is about more than just what's happening in my neck of the woods. If I go to this other city or this other country, they're dealing with these things. And this is how I can help be um, a volunteer or help others who have lives different from mine. So it really spreads out into a lot of different areas. Absolutely. And what I love that you said prior to this, you mentioned uh, in the introduction that it's not just what they've experienced, it's what they've seen, it's what they've heard mm -hmm. and things like that. So could you give me some examples of how vicariously things that they have not experienced, but they can connect to it because they may have seen it on TV or they may have heard someone talk about it. What's an example of a way that you can make a connection with that? Um, so something that jumps out uh, is, so say if we have students who watch the news or they're on social media scrolling, yes. and we, maybe not just include the news, if they're yes. scrolling through TikTok or wherever and they see a news story uh, pop up, and then lo and behold, that same kind of issue pops up uh, in a text that they're reading in their ELA class or yeah. a social studies class, however it comes up. They now, they have this sympathy or empathy, excuse me, for the topic because they see, oh, wow, this, the different types of government, this government over here has a dictatorship or doesn't have a democracy like we're reading about in social studies. And so this is, I see the effects of what happens when people don't get a chance to vote and choose their leaders and they have to just listen to someone who's making all the rules. So now the discussion in the classroom changes. It's not just I'm reading these lines. I see children on TV losing their parents, their homes are destroyed. You know, so 
the investment emotionally and knowledgeably uh, comes together. And I don't know why that came up, but <laughs> that's just one example of I see it. I'm not living it, but I see the hurt. I see the effects. Absolutely. And here, when I'm reading about voting and all these other kinds of things and the types of government, I'm going to value mine a little more because at least I'm not dealing with what I see on TikTok, what I see on Instagram. Absolutely. And, and you talked about empathy. And, and that's some of what we're missing in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to learn how to do that more. And, and I like that you shared that um, when they sit on the news, I, I thought about when I was in school, we used to do current events. And I mm -hmm. never thought current events was a real world connection. That was a real world connection because that's yeah. what we did. So mm -hmm. I, I have to thank my social studies teacher <laughs> the next time I see my uh, ex-football coach, Coach Collins. We used to do uh, current events every week. You had to bring in a little newspaper article and then talk about it. So yes. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so shout out to Coach uh, Collins. <laughs> Good job, well, thank sir. you so much for that. So what are some uh, strategies that we can use for real world connections? So um, one thing that teachers can do, and I think this kind of gets faded out as students get older and the grade levels uh, progress, but manipulatives and things that are hands on that can be moved and changed. Um, especially in math, but it can also happen in science. So if we're learning about multiplication, there are the blocks, the cubes, uh, the different models that kids can use uh, to relate these numbers that I can't touch and feel. But if I give you some blocks or something that you can touch and manipulate, then it becomes a little more, uh, more realistic. In science, okay, we're learning about seeds, but let's actually plant one. I think every elementary school teacher in some grade has gotten a little cup with the brown paper towel, you put the seeds in to watch them germinate and all that kind of stuff. So bring it off the abstract slate and put it in a way where they can be involved in that concept or those skills. Um, so that's one, um, but also encourage questioning and curiosity. So some teachers I've seen, they don't see the, I won't say see the value in, but don't make the time to provide opportunity for kids to ask questions and not necessarily questions that we feel are the good questions, off the wall questions that you didn't even consider. Like I've been stunned by a kid before who's like, that's a good question. I didn't even think about you know, that before. So allow their minds to take what you're giving them and then run off on their own tangent as it will, because those tangent questions could have some, some validity to them and encourage new questions, which is what science, you know, kind of is all about. Let new questions form. Um, and then another way is to, like I started with, find examples from real life that have to do with your content. It could be grocery store, con things that you'll see in a grocery store, things you see at the bank, the beach. I took my son mini golfing once and there were so many <laughs> math and science concepts that we were yes. toying with that day. Um, not all that I brought up to him, but he was learning about them while we were playing mini golf. Um, yeah. So there's everyday things that whether you know it or not connect to something they're going to learn or have learned in class. And you can be getting them uh, comfortable with those things by bringing those to light. And then of course, technology, there's, simulations there's websites that have interactive um scenarios that kids can't get to themselves especially depending on what kind of neighborhoods they live in what they have access to but technology wise simulations and things like that they can get access um, to those kinds of things to give them new context absolutely thank you so much and you said something that i really want you to uh, elaborate on a little bit for new teachers, and you did a great job elaborating on it. You talked about not taking time to ask those questions. And this is not just for new teachers. And yeah. then not only ask those questions, but let questions develop from the students because you said you're in awe sometimes of what they're asked, but those mm -hmm. questions can only bubble up if you take that step back and allow it to unfold. So yeah. talk about that a little bit for our new teachers, because oftentimes they think that when we're in the room or someone is in there to observe and just they think that they should be in control all the time. And really, the beauty of it is facilitation and allowing that lesson to unfold. And sometimes you'll cover so much more. So let's talk about that. Yes. So and it's it, there's a balance because, yes, part of 
what we are trained to do as teachers is plan out questions. And yes, yes still do that. <laughs> okay. Um, some of us can improv, but again, that's that theater in me that allows me to do that. But if you're not an improver, yes, plan your questions. But at the same time, students have to feel, they want to feel involved and they have to feel comfortable enough to ask what is on their mind. Mm -hmm. Think about a time where you've had kids shy away from raising their hand. They don't want to ask questions either because they don't feel their question is a good question or because they think that the response they're going to get from you or their classmates is going to be negative. But when you allow them to have the freedom that you can ask what you want to ask, what you feel you should ask, as long as it's you know coming from what we're talking about, it, like you said, it has a ripple effect. My question initiates Jonathan's question, which ignites Sarah's question, which then brings it back to the first person go, oh, oh yeah. So, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting hot. Because that's that's a big thing. Yeah. When you allow kids to organically talk and discuss in appropriate ways, yes. you get more learning than what your lesson plan may have had on it for that day. Because Absolutely. the kids are centered. It was the lesson was allowed to develop from what your children needed and what they were curious about. So please make that time available. It may not be every day, but Definitely don't kill it when that opportunity starts to rise up. Let them have it. Whatever you had as step three for the lesson plan, do that first tomorrow. <laughs> Let the kids discuss and question and, and just engage with each other. And you just sit back and you just guide the conversation and facilitate. It'll Absolutely. Be <laughs> because you can guide it into the rest of your lesson plan if you allow mm -hmm. it to flow properly. And, and I like that you said make sure that you have your questions planned. Yeah, there's never a time that you should improv teachers. Even <laughs> seasoned teachers need to have their plans there because sometimes things happen that will shake us because yeah. we are dealing with human systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. we don't know what Terry is going to come in with today and it kind of shake you a little bit and it could not be anything bad. It could be something funny and yeah. you just lose your thoughts. So that's what your plans are for, to go back to your plans. Mm -hmm. And that also leads to the point of sometimes uh, we have we need to over plan, but also plan that it's OK if you don't cover the full plan. Yeah. So like plan, but be flexible, if that makes Absolutely. sense. That's not Absolutely. an oxymoron. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not an oxymoron because the plan gets you there. But however, the map, there may be some detours. Yeah. You switch some things up. So thank you so much for that. So. How what should they do to effectively plan now that we're talking about planning? How do you effectively plan for real world connections? How do you find out what are the students' connections? Because a lot of teachers are going to go into schools that they don't live in the community. And oftentimes they may not know the experiences of the children because they may come from a total different background. And I'm not just talking race here because there are some things that my daughter may not know about that she's around other children that look just like her because mm -hmm. their experiences are different. So what can teachers do to kind of capture those experiences to know how to plan, to make those connections? Right. So the, the first thing I do when I'm thinking of how do I connect my content to my kids is knowing who they are, what they are interested in. So if you haven't heard of a student interest survey, that's where you want to start. And not even for real world connections, for building relationships with your children, period. You need to know who they are and what they value so that you don't make assumptions about who they are, what they value. And then this wonderful lesson that you created where you plan to make connections fail because they had nothing to do with them. <laughs> so you want to give them, and you can Google this or create your own. Um, you want to find out what it is they do in their free time, what they enjoy learning about, what things they do regularly, consistently, what careers are they interested in, what are their favorite subjects. Like some people shy away from this one because it makes them a little uncomfortable, but what do they listen to and watch? Yes. I'm luckily I'm lucky enough to where my age is still close enough to the young people. So what they watch and listen to at some point is what I watch and listen to. <laughs> but if you know how many movies and songs I've thrown into a lesson, it would blow your mind. 
But you got to get into their world a little bit. Don't be too uppity and go, oh, I'll listen to that. Okay, you're missing opportunities. So start with that. What are your kids interested in? But then once you know that, um, know your grade level or your subject expectations. And this is goes with your regular teacher planning. Know what your benchmarks are, what your targets are, because that's what you have to now connect what your kids like to. So you can't not know one of those <laughs> and expect to help them uh, make these connections. Um, and then out, once you have those two things, you want to merge them into what I'm calling a blueprint. So I know my target. I know my kids. So based on that, here are some examples that I can bring up for discussion. Say, for example, in science, if the benchmark is heat transfer, knowing how heat transfers from one object to another. There's examples of that in these children's households out in the world. If they like chocolate, who hasn't held a piece of candy on their finger and watched it melt, but maybe don't understand why <laughs> the chocolate melted, but your finger didn't get cold, mm -hmm. you know, because that's not where the heat came from and went to. Um, the iron, holding their laptops on their laps, mm -hmm. feeling the heat come from the laptop onto their skin. So again, you have to know your target, know your benchmark, know your content, and then know what do my kids go through that connects to this. Mm -hmm. And once you have all that, you can have those just ready for discussion and also make questions that go with those things. So, so if I'm going to use the candy thing, okay, what, hap what do we observe um, happening to the chocolate. It's melting. Okay, do you think, well, why is it melting? It must have gotten hot. Where's the heat coming from? Now, they might say the sun or the light, but what's it on? There's heat in your finger. So question planning, again, is part of the blueprint, but also, like I said, knowing your content, knowing what they like, and finding where those two things can merge and then use those for discussion and observation. Thank you so much, Ms. Hollinsworth. This has been so awesome. And I'm so excited about what the new teachers have picked up today. So guys, today we have learned the importance of making real world connections with your students. I like what you dropped in last about that interest inventory and that that's not just about making real world connections with your students. That's about us making connections with our students, period. Mm -hmm. We need to know our students. If we're going to teach them, we need to know them and they need to know us because that's how we build those relationships and build the trust that we uh, have, that we need in the classroom to move forward. So do you want to talk about that a little bit more about get, just getting to know your students in this process? Yes. Um, so being in teaching for about 20 years now, I've, I've learned. I didn't come out teaching this way. I've learned across the years having relationships with your students will benefit you not just in, the, in content and student achievement, but also in their connecting to each other and their, their social emotional presence. And this isn't something I used to talk about when I was younger, but a student who believes that you care about who they are and what they go through, one, yes, will, will work for you, meaning will do what you need them to do, be cooperative, but they'll also trust you and they'll come to you with, you know, whatever concerns they have, this situation is bothering me or I'm in class and I'm having a bad day. I may communicate to that, that to you if I trust you. If not, I'm just going to sit here in the shell and you're going to be going and running around all day wondering why Carrie's not talking in class because I don't feel like I can open up to you. So when your kids trust you, it opens the door to more than, than you really realize. And when you said make connections to us, they need to also make connections to their peers because we, we're not individual beings. We collaborate, we work together. Like you and I, we have businesses of our own individually, but we need to make partnerships with our fellow consultants, but we have to have that platform, those ways to connect to each other. Yeah. So your, your students think that same thing. Because again, they're going to grow up and have to work on teams. They're not going to be individual solopreneurs. We need teams, correct? Yes. So um, I would say there's kids need to connect to not just the content, but also to the people 
that they uh, engage with throughout the day, their peers, the adults. Connections are, are just the the secret sauce <laughs> to, yes. to being successful because we can't do any of this on our own. We need we need those things to happen. Well, thank you so much for sharing that piece. And I'm so glad that you came back around too, because when you first started talking about it, you said that building that relationship with your students helps them to build relationships in the world and with their peers. And you brought it back full circle to talk about that at the end, because what you talked about was we actually model what we do with our children every day. They're looking at us. Mm -hmm. And as a principal, I would always tell the teachers and I just anybody in the building that, hey, they're looking at us. Yeah. How we get along, that's how they're going to get along. Exactly. So we're going to love each other. We're going to high five. We're going to smile and talk. We may not like each other in the lounge. We may fight in the uh, faculty meeting, <laughs> but in front of the children, we are a united front. And what happens is when you're like that, for the most part, 90% to 95% of your building will be like that. Mm -hmm. If that's the environment, most people will usually, you know, come on board with that because who wants to be in an environment that there's tension all the time? Yeah, no. And, and people who can't put things aside for the greater purpose, like Absolutely. we're here to teach how I do it may be different from how you do it, but we're here for the same thing. So we'll, we'll hash out this little piece later, but for now, Let's come together, show these kids how to resolve conflict, <laughs> how to, you know, stay on task and not worry about the little things, you know? So yeah, they're, they're definitely watching us and they will, yes. they will call you out quickly. But didn't you just do such and such with Miss Davis the other day? It's like, mind your business. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you just walk past Miss Davis? She spoke to you and you looked the other way. Why y'all got beef? Why y'all? Oh, time? they all in your business. <laughs> yeah, all oh, they watching business. all the time. So thank you so much for sharing that. And, and I can hear your passion. So that's another topic that we'll have to do because new teachers need to know how to work in their environments as well. Because it's not just knowing the students, it's knowing how to navigate the coworkers and the administrators and all of that to be successful. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. That was a real gem for our new teachers. Yeah. And before, just to go off that, not to say stay in places where you know you feel like that's not the right place. Yes. I started in a in a, in schools that weren't, in the long run, the place I needed to be in. And so I did, you know, decide when it was right to move out and find an environment that was going to be beneficial for me. So I don't want nobody to run and say, oh, stick it out and stay in the environments that you know aren't for you. No, <laughs> um, do your due diligence. But when you know that that environment isn't your environment and not because you're not trying, just go ahead and find the right place. There are differences in, in schools. You know, that's another gem right there because so oftentimes new teachers are going to an environment and it's not so much as that they're not a good teacher. That environment may not be conducive for them. Yes. So they may need to find a new school. So it's not just about keeping them in our schools. We want you in education, period. So if you find that you're not being successful, it may not be just you. It may be that you need to find an environment that supports your style. And that you're going to still have to learn some more, but also environments matter. So thank you so much for sharing that, Ms. Hollingsworth. No and guys, problem. thank you all so much for joining us on the National New Teacher Support Podcast by teachers. And I'm your principal and host, Dr. Terry Ross. Ms. Hollingsworth, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to share uh, with our new teachers? So, yes, I want you to be able to stay in contact with me if there are any questions you have or uh, about this or anything that's on your mind as an educator. So if you are on LinkedIn, you can find me there. Um, just put in Carrie, K-E-R-I, Hollingsworth, and um, it should pop up. There's two on there, but either way, uh, I'll answer one of the two, but I'm also on Instagram, uh, W-O-H underscore E-D, and I'm on Facebook as well, so it just depends on what platform you're on. Uh, work of Heart Ed is my handle on there. And I'm actually um, offering a cohort for developing teachers at Title I Elementary School. So if you are a teacher who is in need of um, additional coaching, um, contact me and I can get you information that you can pass on to your principal. So thank you guys so much for joining us on the National New Teacher Support Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Terry Ross. 
And thank you again for coming back after the break, after the winter break. This is our first podcast for 2024 and the second semester of the 2023-24 school year. So again, thank you. Stay strong. Keep learning. We need you new teachers. So join us again on the National New Teacher Support Podcast. Thank you.